We gather here this morning to worship our God, and as we do so, let's come to Him in a time of prayer as we lift up our hearts to Him. Let's pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this place and for this time and that we can come to you and we thank you for your faithfulness, which is so great. That we can come and we can, wherever we are in life, come knowing that you will give us strength for today and a bright hope for tomorrow in the light of Christ. Be with us, Lord, as we worship you and as we lift our hearts to you. As we gather together in the form of unity and worship, we pray, Lord, that you would just bless us and keep us and help us to feel your presence in this place. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather, I, uh, I, I offer this greeting from the name of God. To those who have been called and who are kept by God the Father, grace, mercy, and peace be yours in abundance, both now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A number of announcements. If you have your bulletins, or if you don't have one, I encourage you to grab one, because there's uh, all sorts of stuff going on, and I'm not going to read all of it. I'll leave that to you. If you uh, can grab one of these, either on your way out, or if you have one already, review it. But uh, a number of things just to be thinking about this week. Uh, one, again, we have coffee and cookies, which has started up. And if you feel so inclined to uh, help with serving that, then there's a sign-up sheet back there. Uh, and also, we have our dining out groups, which are starting up. So please make sure, if you're interested in uh, some fellowship and time together, sign up for that, uh, and we'll uh, be we'll be organizing that. Um, uh, maybe we have other things in our in our uh, that are going on in our lives. Maybe only we know about them, but we know that uh, God hears these things and and um, and blesses us, and and He is the God of healing and the God who's with us always. Let's let's come together, Lord Jesus. You say, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven." Lord, I pray this morning for anyone who is poor in spirit. Anyone who is hurting, anyone who is wondering about what will come even tomorrow. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering near and far. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from the heat wave out west and the fires. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from illness. Lord, we pray for those who are uncertain, maybe not poor in spirit, but just wondering about what will come for those even this week, as we just mentioned, who are anticipating surgery. Calm any fears around these things, Lord. We pray that you would just send your Holy Spirit, that you would surround those who are poor in spirit, that you, Holy Spirit, are the one who brings hope and a future. You tell us, Lord, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We pray, Lord, for those who are mourning losses in this last year. Maybe it's a loss of time as we've been in this time of pandemic. Loss of time spent with family. Loss of time spent with loved ones. Maybe, Lord, we're just at a loss for what to say or how to proceed. Lord, maybe we are mourning the loss of stability. Maybe there are those who have suffered financial hardships, either in our community or our church. We know, Lord, there are many who are unsteady. Lord, we pray for those who are mourning, uh, for those who have lost loved ones in this last year. For those who are no longer have somebody sitting around the table with them. You tell us, Lord, that blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You, Holy Spirit, are the great comforter. For those who are mourning, we pray that you would bring comfort and you would bring peace. Jesus, you tell us, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We pray, Lord, for those who lack power in our society, those who are overlooked. We pray for those who are ravaged by poverty, for those who, are, who struggle to escape this cycle. We pray for those who suffer abuse. We pray for those who cannot speak for themselves. Lord, we pray for the meek. 
You promise they will inherit the earth. Lord, you tell us, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Lord, we thank you for righteousness. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who cares about righteousness and justice. Lord, we pray for those in our community who work towards righteousness and justice. Lord, I want to pray this morning for organizations like Mel Trotter and Degage, those who stand by the homeless populations, those who do not have homes, those who do not have resources. We thank you, Lord, for organizations like Right to Life, those who stand up for the unborn. Lord, those who stand for justice, the stand for those who do not have a voice. Lord, we pray for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for those who pursue truth, who seek justice. You tell us that those who seek it will be satisfied. Lord, you say, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Lord, I thank you for those who show mercy. There are so many even in our own congregation who have such merciful hearts. Hearts that are made for loving. Hearts which are made to show your love. Lord, thank you for the opportunities we have to show mercy, whether it's to our community or to each other. Lord, we pray that if there are those who need mercy, that you would make them known to us. Put them in our path. Help make it so, Lord, we cannot ignore these people. Whether it's in our own midst, here in our congregation, or in our communities, or in our places of work, Lord, there are people all over the place who need mercy, who need forgiveness. Lord, we are the people who come bearing that mercy. You show us what mercy is on the cross. Lord, help us to be people of mercy. Lord, you tell us that when we show mercy, you show us mercy. Lord, make that the case. You tell us, Lord, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We pray, Lord, that you would purify us. Make our hearts pure. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would enter into our hearts, that you would change our hearts, that you would draw us ever closer to you, Father. We know, Lord, that the closer we get to you, the more purified we become. You burn off the dross and the, that which is not good within us, and you make us pure in heart. Holy Spirit, we pray as you tell us that as we are purified, as you walk with us in the road of sanctification, that you will help us to see you more clearly. Lord, we pray that you would help us to know what it is we must do on this road. The discipline we must have on this road in order to see you more clearly, to be purified. You tell us, Lord, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Lord, thank you for those who would fulfill your command to unity. Thank you, Lord, when you can make us peacemakers, when you use us to bring forgiveness and reconciliation in this world. Thank you, Lord, for words spoken that bring peace, words spoken which bring comfort, words spoken which bring forgiveness. Lord, in this week to come, if there are places where we can be peacemakers, we pray that you would help us to see these places. Help us not to ignore opportunities to be peacemakers, but help us to step fully into these opportunities. Help us to step into the opportunity to be people of peace, to spread peace, to be representatives of the Prince of Peace, our Lord Jesus. Lord, you tell us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Lord, we pray for the persecuted church. We pray for those places around the world where people cannot worship freely. We pray, Lord, for places where our brothers and sisters around the world are gathering in secret under fear of persecution. Lord, we pray for brothers and sisters who are standing up for the gospel at, their own, at the expense of their own safety. Lord, we pray that you would help us, even as people look and wonder what we are about to step into this role. 
Lord, even if it means that people might think that we are odd, even if it means people might think we're a little bit different, even if it means, Lord, that people might treat us a little differently, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be bold enough to step into the role that you would have for us as disciple makers, people who are to share the good news of the gospel. Lord, make us strong in this way. Lord, we pray for our society as we say, step into it, as we step into the role of gospel bearers, people who bear the name of Christ, we pray, Lord, that you would make people receptive to our message, your message, your message of truth and peace and mercy and meekness and hopefulness. Lord, we thank you for just who you are for us, that we can come to this place and that we can remember that we are people of your kingdom, that we are people who come rejoicing in the firm and wonderful truth that Jesus has died for us and that now you reign over this entire world. You have the whole world in your hands, Lord. Remind us of these things. Lord, remind us that as we collect our offerings this morning that you give us these things. Even the possessions you give us, they don't really belong to us, Lord. They belong to you. Lord, I pray that uh, you would use what is gathered, that you would use what is gathered for our offerings this morning to bless your kingdom, help it to grow. Lord, may your word spread. Spirit of truth, we pray you would go forward and use this offering to spread the truth. Lord, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're collecting for our general fund and also for our benevolence fund, and uh, we are going to be collecting for our noisy offering. Notice that uh, we've decided that we're going to use the noisy offering for our Mel, the Mel Trotter Bible Distribution Ministry. And again, we just prayed for Mel Trotter. Uh, it's a, an organization which helps the homeless population, and uh, their ultimate goal is to help people see Christ in, uh, in, in wherever they are in life. So uh, deacons and uh, elders, I invite you to come forward to receive the offering. Well, brothers and sisters, as we, uh, as we celebrate this coming together, uh, obviously a part of our coming together week in and week out as God's people is coming together to hear God's word, uh, as you uh, may have heard or maybe you haven't heard, uh, that we're starting a new sermon series on the book of Habakkuk. And the sermon series is going to be entitled Conversations with God. Because that's really what this is. Habakkuk is having a conversation with God. This morning, uh, we're going to read uh, first from actually another book, 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 24 through 27. And then we will also read the first four verses of the book of Habakkuk, and that'll be on page 909. I would encourage you, uh, if you have trouble finding Habakkuk on page 909 today, um, maybe just put a bookmark there or some little piece of paper. I know it's not a book that we turn to all that often or all that, but maybe that would be helpful, just that week in and week out we can turn there easily and not have to uh, struggle to find it. So uh, maybe just take a piece of paper, a piece of your bulletin, and stick it in whatever Bible you normally use, and that way you can turn to it easily. Let's, uh, let's come to God in a time of prayer as we prepare to hear God's word. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time of coming together, this time of profession of our faith. 
not just Jay's faith, but all of our faith. That we come here as an act of profession, week in and week out. Coming here to this place and worshiping you. Acknowledging that every single week as we come, that we are putting our trust and our hope in you and setting our eyes upon you, even when things aren't so ideal, even when things are difficult, even when the future is uncertain. Be with us, Lord, as we hear this word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would lighten our eyes and our hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would help us to see. Help us to come closer to you and to profess even more fully who you are and what you are doing as our God. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, we'll start in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23, verses 24 through 27. 2 Kings, chapter 23, verses 24 through 27. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and spiritists, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things seen in Judah and Jerusalem. This he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book of Hilkiah the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger, which burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to arouse his anger. So the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my presence as I removed Israel. And I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said, My name shall be there. And then turning over to the first four verses of Habakkuk. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This is the word of the Lord. I want us to imagine a situation for a minute. I want us to imagine a situation. I want us to imagine that we are going to our favorite restaurant, whatever it is, and I want us just to imagine for a minute that we are a little bit nosy. We are a little bit nosy, and as we are sitting down to eat, the the waiter or waitress comes and sits us down and As we sit down, we overhear a conversation at the table next to us. We overhear a conversation, and we can't help but listen because, you know, we're a little bit nosy and we want to hear, and they're kind of being loud about it too, and so we got to find out what this is about. And so we hear somebody talking at that table, and they say, everyone makes mistakes. I wonder what's wrong. And the other person says, I just don't know, but I'm worried about it. And all of a sudden, our curiosity is piqued. We're wondering what is going on. We hear just this little snippet of a conversation and our nosiness and our uh, overhearing of it, it just makes us want to know a little bit more. But the thing is, as we listen to this, what do we really know about the conversation so far? What do we really know? And the truth is, 
<laughs> what we do know is we don't know much. We know based on the conversation that it sounds like somebody's made a mistake. It sounds like something's probably wrong. It sounds like somebody's probably worried. That's about all we know. But there's a lot more we don't know about the conversation. Who are these people who are talking? We don't even know who they are. We don't even know who they are. We don't know who they're talking about or what they're talking about. We don't know what mistake has been made. We don't know what has happened that they are so concerned about. And now, again, just imagining that we are nosy. Maybe we are so nosy, we go up to them and we say, hey, I overheard you talking. Tell me what's going on. I want to know. Maybe don't do that in the restaurant, but, you know, just imagine. That's how nosy we want to be. We just want to know. We have to know what is going on in this conversation. What is wrong? We got to find it out. I think reading the prophets is a little bit like stepping into that conversation in that restaurant. It's a little bit like stepping in, and if we don't know the background information, there's going to be a lot that we're not aware of. There's going to be a lot that we don't really know about. And so actually, I think to understand the book of Habakkuk, or any prophet for that matter, I think we have to be a little nosy. We have to lean in a little bit, and we have to understand what is going on in the situation around the prophet. Especially around a book like Habakkuk. I mean, we don't often turn there, I don't think. I don't, when I open my Bible, I don't often say, I'm going to open it and that, I'm just going to read the book of Habakkuk. Uh, does anybody else just do that on a regular basis? No, I see some head nod. If you do, good for you. Well done. It's a wonderful book, but in order to understand it more fully, I think we need to be a little nosy. And that's what I'm going to invite us to do this morning to be a little bit nosy about what is going on in the world of Habakkuk so that we can understand the conversation that Habakkuk is having with God. So, in order to do that, we're going to do a little bit of an overview because I think it helps us to understand where is Habakkuk in Israel's history. And so we're going to do a little bit of an overview uh, quickly in order to get there and understand Habakkuk's context, what has brought him to where he is and what he's writing about. And we're going to start all the way back at the beginning. In the beginning, the God, God created the heavens and the earth and placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And it was all good until Adam and Eve decided to disobey God. They sinned. They rebelled against God, right? And that led to the fall. And from that point on, relationship with God was difficult. Relationship with God was difficult. People just could not quite get it right. Their hearts kept being led astray time and time again. We know the stories about people like Noah. Noah, who God has chosen to be this new person, this new person who's going to be an ambassador, a, a new person in relationship with him, and as soon as Noah gets off the boat, he messes up. And there are stories of God's people over and over again who mess up. But eventually God says, you know what, I'm going to settle my people in a specific place so that they can be in relationship with me just like I've always wanted I'm going to set up what I'm calling the promised land, this land overflowing with milk and honey. I'm going to bring my people to myself. I'm going to bring them into my presence and they will be here with me. And so God calls them into the promised land through Moses and, and he leads them into the promised land, but there's a problem and that's that people's hearts once again go astray. That once again, people, rather than worshiping God, end up going astray and worshiping other gods of all things. God's people, when God has called them into his presence to be just with him and to trust in him as their leader and him as their king, they just go astray. I want us to look at a passage from 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 through 9, this shows us where the people are and what God's desire really was for his people. 
But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you who they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing, doing to you now. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. It's in this passage we see that, again, God's people have gone astray. God's people, when God desired for them to be with him and see him as their king, they say, no, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king to rule over us. And God gives in and says, I'll give it to you. And this sets off a cascade of events in God's people's history. Yes, they dwell in the promised land, but even as they dwell there, the kings often are wicked. We remember perhaps good kings like King David or King Josiah that we read about today, but there are many kings who are not so good. Many kings who lead God's people astray and lead them into ruin Again, we read this passage today about a good king, King Josiah. And King Josiah is probably reigning at about the time that Habakkuk is writing. Josiah is probably reigning about the time that Habakkuk is writing, or Habakkuk maybe is a little bit after. We don't exactly know the time frame, but it's probably around this time. And so we heard this passage today from 2 Kings about the good King Josiah that Josiah got rid of all of the mediums and spiritists and household gods and idols and the other detestable things that had come upon God's people. That he was a good king who remembered God, who tried to lead God's people back to God. And yet we read something troubling. We read that, nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away the, fear, the heat of his fierce anger that, which burned against Judah, because of all that Manasseh, that was another king before Josiah, had done to arouse God's anger. I think that leads us to wonder what was so bad about Manasseh. What was so bad about this king Manasseh who did such wicked in the eyes of the Lord that even a good king couldn't overcome what he did? I'm going to just read a passage here, if you just listen along, about some of the deeds of Manasseh and how he misled God's people to be in a place of, well, real turmoil to being led away from God, which lead to the events that Habakkuk is writing about about foreign powers coming in to take out God's people. Hear this about the wicked king Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel, had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, I will put my name. In the two courts of the temple of the Lord he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, in this temple and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen, out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. I will not again make my feet in the Israel, feet of the Israelites wander from the land I gave their ancestors, if only they will be careful to do everything I commanded them and will keep the whole law that my servant Moses gave them. But the people did not listen. 
Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. This is the context in which Habakkuk finds himself. Habakkuk finds himself in this time where God's people had been led completely and totally astray. Even after the good king Josiah, who had some reform, there are other kings after him. There are Ammon and Jehoahaz, and they only become puppet kings of another nation. They don't really serve God, and God's people are running away, and Habakkuk receives troubling word. He, reserved, he, he hears that God is going to come and wipe his people out and take them into, uh, into exile. That's troubling news for the, per, for, the, uh, for the prophet Habakkuk. He's living in these kind of times when things are in turmoil. He's living in these times when things seem upside down. He's living in these times when he can't quite make sense of everything that's going on around him. He's living in times when he's looking and shaking his head and saying, how can people all around me trust in these things? How can there be other, even more wicked nations than us who God is going to bring in and destroy us? What am I to do with all of this, God? How is it that there are people who have put their trust in idols and military power and human comforts and not in you, God? This, uh, this is Habakkuk's question. This is the conversation that Habakkuk has with God. Trying to make sense of the world around him, trying to make sense of all that is going on, trying to make sense of things that just don't seem to make any sense to Habakkuk, wondering where is God, what kind of God is God, that he would allow these kind of things to happen in their lives. And we're not going to go into all of that today. That's what we'll be exploring in the next several weeks together. What does Habakkuk have to say and what does God have to say to Habakkuk? Before we dive into that, I'll leave us with that, but some ideas, some questions for or some thoughts about what is a prophet. I think it's important for us as we go into this study, into examining this book, to really understand who Habakkuk is. What is a prophet? It's easy to perhaps have a misunderstanding. Well, a, a prophet is somebody who speaks God, speaks for God to the world and who speaks to God. The word prophet actually comes from the Hebrew word nasa, and the word nasa means to lift up. That is, they are lifting up God's name before the people. They are bringing God's name, and they are even bringing the people before God. And we have to remember, a prophet is somebody who is speaking into a very particular historical situation. The context that we've just examined is what Habakkuk is seeing all around him. He's seeing the destruction. He's seeing the future destruction that might come, that God says is going to come. It's important for us to remember that as the prophets write, this is what they are seeing. This is what they are experiencing. This is what they're addressing. They are addressing what they are seeing all around them and what they are hearing God say. Uh, there's a nice book if you are interested in reading more about prophets and what a prophet is. This is actually from one of my seminary professors, but it's called The Prophet and His Message. And it just goes over how to read the prophets well, not just Habakkuk, but uh, any prophets in the Old Testament. A few things he says, about, he says about prophets. He says that prophets are often messengers of woe. They are people who aren't perhaps bringing the most joyful message. They are people who are bringing truth about maybe consequences for what people have done. They also are people who are, we might say, traditionalists. They have a good understanding, an orthodox understanding of who God is. They have an understanding of God's nature and God's character. They have an understanding of who God really is. And another characteristic is that the events they tell about are going to come true. 
And so as Habakkuk is writing, we'll see how the events unfold. The events that he is seeing and prophesying about do come true. Habakkuk is one of these prophets and he's who we're going to be conversing with, his conversation with God that we will be listening into, being a little bit nosy about in the weeks to come. We, as we think about the prophets, we might think about them as people who are sorrowful. We, we, as we just heard, they're people who tell about woeful things. But I think, though, if that's all we think they are, we're missing the point because there are also people who tell about God's promises, about God's future, and about God's character. And unlike what, uh, you know, I, I have some family members, they often like to skip to the end of a movie to find out what happens at the end. I don't like that. I, don't like, I like to be in suspense the whole way through to find out what the ending is going to be and be just led to be really excited and find out and have that twist at the end, whatever it is. But I'm going to violate my own, uh, my, my own ethics there. And I'm going to, every week, I want us to be reminded of the good message that Habakkuk is going to preach. Somebody said earlier this morning, and I, they put it well, it's like an exclamation mark at the end of the book. So as we examine Habakkuk, I'm going to read this every week, and actually I'm going to invite us starting next week, we can recite this together as words of hope and words of promise for us, words about who God is. And so just listen to these words that Habakkuk is going to end with, this message of hope. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. These are the promising words that Habakkuk will eventually receive. That's what we will be working towards and the words that we ourselves can remember that God enables us to tread on the heights like a deer. That even in the midst of a world that is broken and falling apart that we can yet praise our God for our God is a good God. Amen? Amen. Hear these questions as we think about what is to come and about this week as we consider, uh, consider as our uh, conversation uh, that we're going to hear from Habakkuk with God. Why is it important for us to understand what's happening historically around a prophet? Why might that be important for us to think about? As we think about a prophet, what are some characteristics of a prophet? What makes a prophet a prophet? There are more than the ones that I just said, but maybe if you have a study Bible, there's probably some notes in there about prophets. Maybe look at that, see what it has to say. And what were some of the historical situations that Habakkuk was experiencing? Who were some of the kings who ruled around the time that Habakkuk was writing? And you can look at 2 Kings verses, chapters 21 through 23 if you want to look more into that. So God is inviting us into this conversation. He's inviting us to be a little bit nosy, to investigate and to hear just what he is doing and what he is saying and what he has to say, the good news that he has to give to the prophet Habakkuk and to us. Let's, uh, let's come to God in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the book of Habakkuk. We thank you, Lord, that you strengthen us and enable us and help us, even in the most turbulent times, to remember who you are. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who never fails. You are a God who is never out of control. You are a God who is always watching us and always with us. Nothing is out of your grasp. Lord, sometimes in the world around us it can seem difficult to understand what is going on, and yet, Lord, as you will tell Habakkuk, Nothing is out of your grasp. Lord, your plans are good and your promises endure forever. Remind us of that, especially in our Lord Jesus, that you have redeemed us and that you strengthen us every single day. Give us strength if we need it. Give us hope if we need it, Lord. Help us to see our ultimate hope and our promise in you and nothing else. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I invite us to rise to sing Like a River Glorious. us and keeps us. Go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his perfect face towards you and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Amen.